In radio, an antenna is the interface between radio waves propagating through space and electric currents moving in metal conductors, used with a transmitter or receiver. In transmission, a radio transmitter supplies an electric current to the antenna's terminals, and the antenna radiates the energy from the current as electromagnetic waves, radio waves. In reception, an antenna intercepts some of the power of a radio wave in order to produce an electric current at its terminals, that is applied to a receiver to be amplified. Antennas are essential components of all radio equipment, and are used in radio broadcasting, broadcast television, two-way radio, communications receivers, radar, cell phones, satellite communications and other devices. An antenna is an array of conductors elements, electrically connected to the receiver or transmitter. During transmission, the oscillating current applied to the antenna by a transmitter creates an oscillating electric field and magnetic field around the antenna elements. These time-varying fields radiate energy away from the antenna into space as a moving transverse electromagnetic field wave, a radio wave. Conversely, during reception, the oscillating electric and magnetic fields of an incoming radio wave exert force on the electrons in the antenna elements, causing them to move back and forth, creating oscillating currents in the antenna. Antennas can be designed to transmit and receive radio waves in all horizontal directions equally omnidirectional antennas, or preferentially in a particular direction directional or high-gain antennas. An antenna may include parasitic elements, parabolic reflectors or horns, which serve to direct the radio waves into a beam or other desired radiation pattern. The first antennas were built in 1888 by German physicist Heinrich Hertz in his pioneering experiments to prove the existence of electromagnetic waves predicted by the theory of James Clerk Maxwell. Hertz placed dipole antennas at the focal point of parabolic reflectors for both transmitting and receiving. He published his work in Annalen der Physik und Chemie, Volume 36, 1889. Topic: <laughs> Terminology. The words antenna and aerial are used interchangeably. Occasionally the term, aerial, is used to mean a wire antenna. The origin of the word antenna relative to wireless apparatus is attributed to Italian radio pioneer Guglielmo Marconi. In the summer of 1895, Marconi began testing his wireless system outdoors on his father's estate near Bologna and soon began to experiment with long wire, aerials, suspended from a pole. In Italian a tent pole is known as l'antenna centrale, and the pole with the wire was simply called l'antenna. Until then wireless radiating transmitting and receiving elements were known simply as terminals. Because of his prominence, Marconi's use of the word antenna spread among wireless researchers, and later to the general public. Antenna may refer broadly to an entire assembly including support structure, enclosure, if any, etc., in addition to the actual functional components. Especially at microwave frequencies, a receiving antenna may include not only the actual electrical antenna but an integrated preamplifier or mixer. Topic. Overview Antennas are required by any radio receiver or transmitter to couple its electrical connection to the electromagnetic field. Radio waves are electromagnetic waves which carry signals through the air or through space at the speed of light with almost no transmission loss. Radio transmitters and receivers are used to convey signals in broadcast audio, radio, television, mobile telephones, Wi-Fi WLAN, data networks, and remote control devices among many others. Radio waves are also used directly for measurements in radar, GPS, and radio astronomy. Transmitters and receivers require antennas, although these are sometimes hidden such as the antenna inside an AM radio or inside a laptop computer equipped with Wi-Fi. 
antennas can be classified as omnidirectional, radiating energy approximately equally in all directions, or directional, where energy radiates more along one direction than others. Antennas are reciprocal, so the same effect occurs for reception of radio waves. A completely uniform omnidirectional antenna is not physically possible. Many important antenna types have a uniform radiation pattern in the horizontal plane, but send little energy upward or downward. A «directional» antenna usually is intended to maximize its coupling to the electromagnetic field in the direction of the other station. One example of omnidirectional antennas is the very common vertical antenna or whip antenna consisting of a metal rod. A dipole antenna is similar but consists of two such conductors extending in opposite directions. Dipoles are typically oriented horizontally in which case they are weakly directional, signals are reasonably well radiated toward or received from all directions with the exception of the direction along the conductor itself, this region is called the antenna blind cone or null. Both the vertical and dipole antennas are simple in construction and relatively inexpensive. The dipole antenna, which is the basis for most antenna designs, is a balanced component, with equal but opposite voltages and currents applied at its two terminals through a balanced transmission line or to a coaxial transmission line through a so-called ballon. The vertical antenna, on the other hand, is a monopole antenna. It is typically connected to the inner conductor of a coaxial transmission line or a matching network. The shield of the transmission line is connected to ground. In this way, the ground or any large conductive surface plays the role of the second conductor of a dipole, thereby forming a complete circuit. Since monopole antennas rely on a conductive ground, a so-called grounding structure may be employed to provide a better ground contact to the earth or which itself acts as a ground plane to perform that function regardless of or in absence of an actual contact with the earth. Antennas more complex than the dipole or vertical designs are usually intended to increase the directivity and consequently the gain of the antenna. This can be accomplished in many different ways leading to a plethora of antenna designs. The vast majority of designs are fed with a balanced line unlike a monopole antenna and are based on the dipole antenna with additional components or elements which increase its directionality. Antenna gain in this instance describes the concentration of radiated power into a particular solid angle of space, as opposed to the spherically uniform radiation of the ideal radiator. The increased power in the desired direction is at the expense of that in the undesired directions. Power is conserved, and there is no net power increase over that delivered from the power source the transmitter. For instance, a phased array consists of two or more simple antennas which are connected together through an electrical network. This often involves a number of parallel dipole antennas with a certain spacing. Depending on the relative phase introduced by the network, the same combination of dipole antennas can operate as a broadside array, directional normal to a line connecting the elements, or as an end fire array directional along the line connecting the elements. Antenna arrays may employ any basic omnidirectional or weakly directional antenna type, such as dipole, loop or slot antennas. These elements are often identical. However a log periodic dipole array consists of a number of dipole elements of different lengths in order to obtain a somewhat directional antenna having an extremely wide bandwidth, these are frequently used for television reception in fringe areas. The dipole antennas composing it are all considered active elements, since they are all electrically connected together and to the transmission line. On the other hand, a superficially similar dipole array, the Yagi Uda antenna, or simply Yagi, has only one dipole element with an electrical connection. The other so called parasitic elements interact with the electromagnetic field in order to realize a fairly directional antenna but one which is limited to a rather narrow bandwidth. 
The Yagi antenna has similar looking parasitic dipole elements but which act differently due to their somewhat different lengths. There may be a number of so called directors in front of the active element in the direction of propagation, and usually a single but possibly more reflector on the opposite side of the active element. Greater directionality can be obtained using beam forming techniques such as a parabolic reflector or a horn. Since high directivity in an antenna depends on it being large compared to the wavelength, narrow beams of this type are more easily achieved at UHF and microwave frequencies. At low frequencies such as AM broadcast, arrays of vertical towers are used to achieve directionality and they will occupy large areas of land. For reception, a long beverage antenna can have significant directivity. For non-directional portable use, a short vertical antenna or small loop antenna works well, with the main design challenge being that of impedance matching. With a vertical antenna a loading coil at the base of the antenna may be employed to cancel the reactive component of impedance. Small loop antennas are tuned with parallel capacitors for this purpose. An antenna led in is the transmission line, or feed line, which connects the antenna to a transmitter or receiver. The antenna feed may refer to all components connecting the antenna to the transmitter or receiver, such as an impedance matching network in addition to the transmission line. In a so called aperture antenna, such as a horn or parabolic dish, the feed may also refer to a basic antenna inside the entire system normally at the focus of the parabolic dish or at the throat of a horn which could be considered the one active element in that antenna system. A microwave antenna may also be fed directly from a waveguide in place of a conductive transmission line. An antenna counterpoise, or ground plane, is a structure of conductive material which improves or substitutes for the ground. It may be connected to or insulated from the natural ground. In a monopole antenna, this aids in the function of the natural ground, particularly where variations or limitations of the characteristics of the natural ground interfere with its proper function. Such a structure is normally connected to the return connection of an unbalanced transmission line such as the shield of a coaxial cable. An electromagnetic wave refractor in some aperture antennas is a component which due to its shape and position functions to selectively delay or advance portions of the electromagnetic wavefront passing through it. The refractor alters the spatial characteristics of the wave on one side relative to the other side. It can, for instance, bring the wave to a focus or alter the wave front in other ways, generally in order to maximize the directivity of the antenna system. This is the radio equivalent of an optical lens. An antenna coupling network is a passive network generally a combination of inductive and capacitive circuit elements used for impedance matching in between the antenna and the transmitter or receiver. This may be used to improve the standing wave ratio in order to minimize losses in the transmission line and to present the transmitter or receiver with a standard resistive impedance that it expects to see for optimum operation. Reciprocity It is a fundamental property of antennas that the electrical characteristics of an antenna described in the next section, such as gain, radiation pattern, impedance, bandwidth, resonant frequency and polarization, are the same whether the antenna is transmitting or receiving. For example, the receiving pattern Sensitivity as a function of direction of an antenna when used for reception is identical to the radiation pattern of the antenna when it is driven and functions as a radiator. This is a consequence of the reciprocity theorem of electromagnetics. Therefore, in discussions of antenna properties no distinction is usually made between receiving and transmitting terminology, and the antenna can be viewed as either transmitting or receiving, whichever is more convenient. 
A necessary condition for the aforementioned reciprocity property is that the materials in the antenna and transmission medium are linear and reciprocal. Reciprocal or bilateral means that the material has the same response to an electric current or magnetic field in one direction, as it has to the field or current in the opposite direction. Most materials used in antennas meet these conditions, but some microwave antennas use high-tech components such as isolators and circulators, made of nonreciprocal materials such as ferrite. These can be used to give the antenna a different behavior on receiving than it has on transmitting, which can be useful in applications like radar. Characteristics Antennas are characterized by a number of performance measures which a user would be concerned with in selecting or designing an antenna for a particular application. Chief among these relate to the directional characteristics as depicted in the antenna's radiation pattern and the resulting gain. Even in omnidirectional or weakly directional antennas, the gain can often be increased by concentrating more of its power in the horizontal directions, sacrificing power radiated toward the sky and ground. The antenna's power gain or simply gain also takes into account the antenna's efficiency and is often the primary figure of merit. Resonant antennas are expected to be used around a particular resonant frequency, an antenna must therefore be built or ordered to match the frequency range of the intended application. A particular antenna design will present a particular feedpoint impedance. While this may affect the choice of an antenna, an antenna's impedance can also be adapted to the desired impedance level of a system using a matching network while maintaining the other characteristics except for a possible loss of efficiency. Although these parameters can be measured in principle, such measurements are difficult and require very specialized equipment. Beyond tuning a transmitting antenna using an SWR meter, the typical user will depend on theoretical predictions based on the antenna design or on claims of a vendor. An antenna transmits and receives radio waves with a particular polarization which can be reoriented by tilting the axis of the antenna in many but not all, cases. The physical size of an antenna is often a practical issue, particularly at lower frequencies longer wavelengths. Highly directional antennas need to be significantly larger than the wavelength. Resonant antennas usually use a linear conductor or element, or pair of such elements, each of which is about a quarter of the wavelength in length an odd multiple of quarter wavelengths will also be resonant. Antennas that are required to be small compared to the wavelength sacrifice efficiency and cannot be very directional. At higher frequencies UHF, microwaves trading off performance to obtain a smaller physical size is usually not required. <laughs> Resonant antennas The majority of antenna designs are based on the resonance principle. This relies on the behavior of moving electrons, which reflect off surfaces where the dielectric constant changes, in a fashion similar to the way light reflects when optical properties change. In these designs, the reflective surface is created by the end of a conductor, normally a thin metal wire or rod, which in the simplest case has a feed point at one end where it is connected to a transmission line. The conductor, or element, is aligned with the electrical field of the desired signal, normally meaning it is perpendicular to the line from the antenna to the source or receiver in the case of a broadcast antenna, the radio signal's electrical component induces a voltage in the conductor. This causes an electrical current to begin flowing in the direction of the signal's instantaneous field. When the resulting current reaches the end of the conductor, it reflects, which is equivalent to a 180-degree change in phase. 
If the conductor is one quarter of a wavelength long, current from the feed point will undergo 90 degree phase change by the time it reaches the end of the conductor, reflect through 180 degrees, and then another 90 degrees as it travels back. That means it has undergone a total 360 degree phase change, returning it to the original signal. The current in the element thus adds to the current being created from the source at that instant. This process creates a standing wave in the conductor, with the maximum current at the feed. The ordinary half wave dipole is probably the most widely used antenna design. This consists of two one-quarter wavelength elements arranged end-to-end, -end, and lying along essentially the same axis or collinear, each feeding one side of a two-conductor transmission wire. The physical arrangement of the two elements places them 180 degrees out of phase, which means that at any given instant one of the elements is driving current into the transmission line while the other is pulling it out. The monopole antenna is essentially one half of the half wave dipole, a single one quarter wavelength element with the other side connected to ground or an equivalent ground plane or counterpoise. Monopoles, which are one half the size of a dipole, are common for long wavelength radio signals where a dipole would be impractically large. Another common design is the folded dipole, which is essentially two dipoles placed side by side and connected at their ends to make a single one-wavelength antenna. The standing wave forms with this desired pattern at the design frequency, F0, and antennas are normally designed to be this size. However, feeding that element with 3 F0 whose wavelength is one-third that of F0 will also lead to a standing wave pattern. Thus, an antenna element is also resonant when its length is three quarters of a wavelength. This is true for all odd multiples of one quarter wavelength. This allows some flexibility of design in terms of antenna lengths and feed points. Antennas used in such a fashion are known to be harmonically operated. Topic: <laughs> Current and voltage distribution. The quarter wave elements imitate a series resonant electrical element due to the standing wave present along the conductor. At the resonant frequency, the standing wave has a current peak and voltage node minimum at the feed. In electrical terms, this means the element has minimum reactance, generating the maximum current for minimum voltage. This is the ideal situation, because it produces the maximum output for the minimum input, producing the highest possible efficiency. Contrary to an ideal lossless series resonant circuit, a finite resistance remains corresponding to the relatively small voltage at the feed point due to the antenna's radiation resistance as well as any actual electrical losses. Recall that a current will reflect when there are changes in the electrical properties of the material. In order to efficiently send the signal into the transmission line, it is important that the transmission line has the same impedance as the elements, otherwise some of the signal will be reflected back into the antenna. This leads to the concept of impedance matching, the design of the overall system of antenna and transmission line so the impedance is as close as possible, thereby reducing these losses. Impedance matching between antennas and transmission lines is commonly handled through the use of a ballon, although other solutions are also used in certain roles. An important measure of this basic concept is the standing wave ratio, which measures the magnitude of the reflected signal. Consider a half-wave dipole designed to work with signal's 1 meter wavelength, meaning the antenna would be approximately 50 cm across. If the element has a length to diameter ratio of 1000, it will have an inherent resistance of about 63 ohms. Using the appropriate transmission wire or ballon, we match that resistance to ensure minimum signal loss. Feeding that antenna with a current of 1 ampere will require 63 volts of RF, and the antenna will radiate 63 watts ignoring losses of radio frequency power. 
Now consider the case when the antenna is fed a signal with a wavelength of 1.25 meters. In this case, the reflected current would arrive at the feed out of phase with the signal, causing the net current to drop while the voltage remains the same. Electrically, this appears to be a very high impedance. The antenna and transmission line no longer have the same impedance, and the signal will be reflected back into the antenna, reducing output. This could be addressed by changing the matching system between the antenna and transmission line, but that solution only works well at the new design frequency. The end result is that the resonant antenna will efficiently feed a signal into the transmission line only when the source signal's frequency is close to that of the design frequency of the antenna, or one of the resonant multiples. This makes resonant antenna designs inherently narrowband, and they are most commonly used with a single target signal. They are particularly common on radar systems, where the same antenna is used for both broadcast and reception, or for radio and television broadcasts, where the antenna is working with a single frequency. They are less commonly used for reception where multiple channels are present, in which case additional modifications are used to increase the bandwidth, or entirely different antenna designs are used. <laughs> Electrically short antennas it is possible to use simple impedance matching techniques to allow the use of monopole or dipole antennas substantially shorter than the one quarter or one half wavelength, respectively, at which they are resonant. As these antennas are made shorter for a given frequency, their impedance becomes dominated by a series capacitive negative reactance by adding a series inductance with the opposite positive reactance, a so-called loading coil. The antenna's reactance may be cancelled leaving only a pure resistance. Sometimes the resulting lower electrical resonant frequency of such a system antenna plus matching network is described using the concept of electrical length, so an antenna used at a lower frequency than its resonant frequency is called an electrically short antenna for example, at 30 MHz 10 meters wavelength, a true resonant one-quarter wavelength monopole would be almost 2.5 meters long, and using an antenna only 1.5 meters tall would require the addition of a loading coil. Then it may be said that the coil has lengthened the antenna to achieve an electrical length of 2.5 meters. However, the resulting resistive impedance achieved will be quite a bit lower than that of a true one-quarter wave resonant monopole, often requiring further impedance matching a transformer to the desired transmission line. For ever shorter antennas requiring greater electrical lengthening the radiation resistance plummets approximately according to the square of the antenna length so that the mismatch due to a net reactance away from the electrical resonance worsens or one could as well say that the equivalent resonant circuit of the antenna system has a higher q factor and thus a reduced bandwidth which can even become inadequate for the transmitted signals spectrum Resistive losses due to the loading coil, relative to the decreased radiation resistance, entail a reduced electrical efficiency, which can be of great concern for a transmitting antenna, but bandwidth is the major factor that sets the size of antennas at 1 MHz and lower frequencies. <laughs> Arrays and reflectors The amount of signal received from a distant transmission source is essentially geometric in nature due to the inverse square law, and this leads to the concept of effective area. This measures the performance of an antenna by comparing the amount of power it generates to the amount of power in the original signal, measured in terms of the signal's power density in watts per square meter. A half-wave dipole has an effective area of 0.13. Lambda display style lambda 2 if more performance is needed one cannot simply make the antenna larger although this would intercept more energy from the signal due to the considerations above it would decrease the output significantly due to it moving away from the resonant length 
In roles where higher performance is needed, designers often use multiple elements combined together. Returning to the basic concept of current flows in a conductor, consider what happens if a half-wave dipole is not connected to a feed point, but instead shorted out. Electrically this forms a single one-half wavelength element. But the overall current pattern is the same, the current will be zero at the two ends, and reach a maximum in the center. Thus signals near the design frequency will continue to create a standing wave pattern. Any varying electrical current, like the standing wave in the element, will radiate a signal. In this case, aside from resistive losses in the element, the rebroadcast signal will be significantly similar to the original signal in both magnitude and shape. If this element is placed so its signal reaches the main dipole in phase, it will reinforce the original signal, and increase the current in the dipole. Elements used in this way are known as passive elements. A Yagi Uda array uses passive elements to greatly increase gain. It is built along a support boom that is pointed toward the signal, and thus sees no induced signal and does not contribute to the antenna's operation. The end closer to the source is referred to as the front. Near the rear is a single active element, typically a half wave dipole or folded dipole. Passive elements are arranged in front directors and behind reflectors the active element along the boom. The Yagi has the inherent quality that it becomes increasingly directional, and thus has higher gain, as the number of elements increases. However, this also makes it increasingly sensitive to changes in frequency. If the signal frequency changes, not only does the active element receive less energy directly, but all of the passive elements adding to that signal also decrease their output as well and their signals no longer reach the active element in phase. It is also possible to use multiple active elements and combine them together with transmission lines to produce a similar system where the phases add up to reinforce the output. The antenna array and very similar reflective array antenna consist of multiple elements, often half-wave dipoles, spaced out on a plane and wired together with transmission lines with specific phase lengths to produce a single in-phase signal at the output. The log periodic antenna is a more complex design that uses multiple inline elements similar in appearance to the Yagi Uda but using transmission lines between the elements to produce the output. Reflection of the original signal also occurs when it hits an extended conductive surface, in a fashion similar to a mirror. This effect can also be used to increase signal through the use of a reflector, normally placed behind the active element and spaced so the reflected signal reaches the element in phase. Generally the reflector will remain highly reflective even if it is not solid, gaps less than one-tenth. Lambda Display style Lambda Generally have little effect on the outcome. For this reason, reflectors often take the form of wire meshes or rows of passive elements, which makes them lighter and less subject to wind load effects, of particular importance when mounted at higher elevations with respect to the surrounding structures. The parabolic reflector is perhaps the best known example of a reflector-based antenna, which has an effective area far greater than the active element alone. Topic. Bandwidth Although a resonant antenna has a purely resistive feed point impedance at a particular frequency, many if not most, applications require using an antenna over a range of frequencies. The frequency range or bandwidth over which an antenna functions well can be very wide as in a log periodic antenna or narrow as in a small loop antenna. Outside this range the antenna impedance becomes a poor match to the transmission line and transmitter or receiver. In the case of the Yagi Uda and other director reflector arrays, use of the antenna well away from its design frequency affects its radiation pattern, reducing its directive gain, so the usable bandwidth is then limited regardless of impedance matching. 
Aside from the problem of the changed directional pattern, the feed impedance of an antenna system can always be accommodated at any frequency by using a suitable matching network. This is most efficiently accomplished using a matching network at the feed point on the antenna, in effect changing the resonant frequency of the antenna. However, simply adjusting a remote matching network at the transmitter or receiver will leave the transmission line with a poor standing wave ratio. With low impedance lines, such as the now popular coaxial cable, the consequently high currents will result in high loss in the cable and low overall efficiency. Instead, it is often desired to have an antenna whose impedance does not vary so greatly over a certain bandwidth. It turns out that the amount of reactants seen at the terminals of a resonant antenna when the frequency is shifted, say, by 5%, depends on the diameter of the conductor used. A long thin wire used as a half-wave dipole or quarter-wave monopole will have a reactance significantly greater than the resistive impedance it has at resonance, leading to a poor match and generally unacceptable performance. Making the element using a tube of a diameter perhaps 1 50th of its length, however, results in a reactance at this altered frequency which is not so great, and a much less serious mismatch and effect on the antenna's net performance. Thus rather thick tubes are often used for the elements, these also have reduced parasitic resistance loss. Rather than just using a thick tube, there are similar techniques used to the same effect such as replacing thin wire elements with cages to simulate a thicker element. This widens the bandwidth of the resonance. On the other hand, it is desired for amateur radio antennas to operate at several bands which are widely separated from each other but not in between. This can often be accomplished by simply connecting elements resonant at those different frequencies in parallel. Most of the transmitter's power will flow into the resonant element while the others present a high reactive impedance, thus drawing little current from the same voltage. Another popular solution uses so-called traps consisting of parallel resonant circuits which are strategically placed in breaks along each antenna element. When used at one particular frequency band the trap presents a very high impedance parallel resonance effectively truncating the element at that length, making it a proper resonant antenna. At a lower frequency the trap allows the full length of the element to be employed, albeit with a shifted resonant frequency due to the inclusion of the trap's net reactance at that lower frequency. The bandwidth characteristics of a resonant antenna element can be characterized according to its Q, just as one uses to characterize the sharpness of an LC resonant circuit. A common mistake is to assume that there is an advantage in an antenna having a high Q, the so-called quality factor. In the context of electronic circuitry a low Q generally signifies greater loss due to unwanted resistance in a resonant LC circuit, and poorer receiver selectivity. However this understanding does not apply to resonant antennas where the resistance involved is the radiation resistance, a desired quantity which removes energy from the resonant element in order to radiate it the purpose of an antenna, after all. The Q of an LCR circuit is defined as the ratio of the inductors or capacitors reactance to the resistance, so for a certain radiation resistance the radiation resistance at resonance does not vary greatly with diameter the greater reactance off resonance causes the poorer bandwidth of an antenna employing a very thin conductor. The Q of such a narrowband antenna can be as high as 15. On the other hand, the reactance at the same off-resonant frequency of one using thick elements is much less, consequently resulting in a Q as low as 5. These two antennas may perform equivalently at the resonant frequency, but the second antenna will perform over a bandwidth three times as wide as the antenna consisting of a thin conductor. Antennas for use over much broader frequency ranges are achieved using further techniques. Adjustment of a matching network can, in principle, allow for any antenna to be matched at any frequency. 
Thus the small loop antenna built into most AM broadcast medium wave receivers has a very narrow bandwidth, but is tuned using a parallel capacitance which is adjusted according to the receiver tuning. On the other hand, log periodic antennas are not resonant at any frequency but can be built to attain similar characteristics including feedpoint impedance over any frequency range. These are therefore commonly used in the form of directional log periodic dipole arrays as television antennas. Topic: <laughs> gain. Gain is a parameter which measures the degree of directivity of the antenna's radiation pattern. A high-gain antenna will radiate most of its power in a particular direction, while a low-gain antenna will radiate over a wider angle. The antenna gain, or power gain of an antenna is defined as the ratio of the intensity power per unit surface area I display style script style I radiated by the antenna in the direction of its maximum output at an arbitrary distance divided by the intensity i iso display style script style i underscore text iso radiated at the same distance by a hypothetical isotropic antenna which radiates equal power in all directions this dimensionless ratio is usually expressed logarithmically in decibels. These units are called decibels isotropic. dBi g dBi equals 10 log i i iso Display style g underscore text dBi equals 10 log i over i underscore text iso. A second unit used to measure gain is the ratio of the power radiated by the antenna to the power radiated by a half-wave dipole antenna. I dipole display style script style i underscore text dipole. These units are called decibels dipole. DBD G DBD equals ten log I I dipole display style G underscore text DBD equals ten log I over I underscore text dipole since the gain of a half-wave dipole is 2.15 dBi and the logarithm of a product is additive, the gain in dBi is just 2.15 dB greater than the gain in dBd g dBi equals g dBd plus 2.15 Display style g underscore text dBi equals g underscore text dBd plus 2.15. High gain antennas have the advantage of longer range and better signal quality, but must be aimed carefully at the other antenna. An example of a high gain antenna is a parabolic dish such as a satellite television antenna. Low gain antennas have shorter range, but the orientation of the antenna is relatively unimportant. An example of a low gain antenna is the WIP antenna found on portable radios and cordless phones. Antenna gain should not be confused with amplifier gain, a separate parameter measuring the increase in signal power due to an amplifying device placed at the front end of the system, such as a low noise amplifier. Topic. Effective area or aperture The effective area or effective aperture of a receiving antenna expresses the portion of the power of a passing electromagnetic wave which it delivers to its terminals, expressed in terms of an equivalent area. 
For instance, if a radio wave passing a given location has a flux of 1 pW per square meter, 10^-12 watts per square meter, and an antenna has an effective area of 12 square meters, then the antenna would deliver 12 pW of RF power to the receiver, 30 microvolts RMS at 75 ohms. Since the receiving antenna is not equally sensitive to signals received from all directions, the effective area is a function of the direction to the source. Due to reciprocity discussed above, the gain of an antenna used for transmitting must be proportional to its effective area when used for receiving. Consider an antenna with no loss, that is, one whose electrical efficiency is 100%. It can be shown that its effective area averaged over all directions must be equal to lambda 2 quarters pi, the wavelength squared divided by 4 pi. Gain is defined such that the average gain over all directions for an antenna with 100% electrical efficiency is equal to 1. Therefore, the effective area AEFF in terms of the gain G in a given direction is given by A E F F equals lambda two four pi g display style a underscore mathrm f equals lambda caret two over four pi g for an antenna with an efficiency of less than one hundred percent, both the effective area and gain are reduced by that same amount. Therefore, the above relationship between gain and effective area still holds. These are thus two different ways of expressing the same quantity. AEFF is especially convenient when computing the power that would be received by an antenna of a specified gain, as illustrated by the above example. Topic: <inaudible> Radiation pattern. The radiation pattern of an antenna is a plot of the relative field strength of the radio waves emitted by the antenna at different angles in the far field. It is typically represented by a three-dimensional graph, or polar plots of the horizontal and vertical cross-sections. The pattern of an ideal isotropic antenna, which radiates equally in all directions, would look like a sphere. Many nondirectional antennas, such as monopoles and dipoles, emit equal power in all horizontal directions, with the power dropping off at higher and lower angles. This is called an omnidirectional pattern and when plotted looks like a torus or donut. The radiation of many antennas shows a pattern of maxima or lobes at various angles, separated by nulls, angles where the radiation falls to zero. This is because the radio waves emitted by different parts of the antenna typically interfere, causing maxima at angles where the radio waves arrive at distant points in phase, and zero radiation at other angles where the radio waves arrive out of phase. In a directional antenna designed to project radio waves in a particular direction, the lobe in that direction is designed larger than the others and is called the main lobe. The other lobes usually represent unwanted radiation and are called side lobes. The axis through the main lobe is called the principal axis or boresight axis. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Field regions. The space surrounding an antenna can be divided into three concentric regions, the reactive near field also called the inductive near field, the radiating near field Fresnel region, and the far field Fraunhofer regions. These regions are useful to identify the field structure in each, although there are no precise boundaries. The far field region is far enough from the antenna to ignore its size and shape. It can be assumed that the electromagnetic wave is purely a radiating plane wave. Electric and magnetic fields are in phase and perpendicular to each other and to the direction of propagation. This simplifies the mathematical analysis of the radiated field. Topic: 
Impedance As an electromagnetic wave travels through the different parts of the antenna system radio, feed line, antenna, free space it may encounter differences in impedance E, H, V, I, etc. At each interface, depending on the impedance match, some fraction of the wave's energy will reflect back to the source, forming a standing wave in the feed line. The ratio of maximum power to minimum power in the wave can be measured and is called the standing wave ratio SWR. A SWR of 1 to 1 is ideal. A SWR of 1.5, 1 is considered to be marginally acceptable in low power applications where power loss is more critical, although an SWR as high as 6 to 1 may still be usable with the right equipment. Minimizing impedance differences at each interface impedance matching will reduce SWR and maximize power transfer through each part of the antenna system. Complex impedance of an antenna is related to the electrical length of the antenna at the wavelength in use. The impedance of an antenna can be matched to the feed line and radio by adjusting the impedance of the feed line, using the feed line as an impedance transformer. More commonly, the impedance is adjusted at the load see below with an antenna tuner, a ballon, a matching transformer, matching networks composed of inductors and capacitors, or matching sections such as the gamma match. <laughs> <laughs> Efficiency Efficiency of a transmitting antenna is the ratio of power actually radiated in all directions to the power absorbed by the antenna terminals. The power supplied to the antenna terminals which is not radiated is converted into heat. This is usually through loss resistance in the antenna's conductors, but can also be due to dielectric or magnetic core losses in antennas or antenna systems using such components. Such loss effectively robs power from the transmitter, requiring a stronger transmitter in order to transmit a signal of a given strength. For instance, if a transmitter delivers 100 W into an antenna having an efficiency of 80%, then the antenna will radiate 80 W as radio waves and produce 20 W of heat. In order to radiate 100 W of power, one would need to use a transmitter capable of supplying 125 W to the antenna. Antenna efficiency is separate from impedance matching, which may also reduce the amount of power radiated using a given transmitter. If an SWR meter reads 150 W of incident power and 50 W of reflected power, that means 100 W have actually been absorbed by the antenna ignoring transmission line losses. How much of that power has actually been radiated cannot be directly determined through electrical measurements at or before the antenna terminals, but would require for instance, careful measurement of field strength. The loss resistance and efficiency of an antenna can be calculated. The loss resistance will generally affect the feedpoint impedance, adding to its resistive component. That resistance will consist of the sum of the radiation resistance RR and the loss resistance RLOSs. If a current I is delivered to the terminals of an antenna, then a power of I2RR will be radiated and a power of I2RLOSs will be lost as heat. Therefore, the efficiency of an antenna is equal to RR, RR plus RLOSs. Only the total resistance RR plus RLOSs can be directly measured. According to reciprocity, the efficiency of an antenna used as a receiving antenna is identical to the efficiency as defined above. The power that an antenna will deliver to a receiver with a proper impedance match is reduced by the same amount. In some receiving applications, the very inefficient antennas may have little impact on performance. At low frequencies, for example, atmospheric or man-made noise can mask antenna inefficiency. For example, CCIR rep 
258-3 indicates man-made noise in a residential setting at 40 MHz is about 28 dB above the thermal noise floor. Consequently, an antenna with a 20 dB loss due to inefficiency would have little impact on system noise performance. The loss within the antenna will affect the intended signal and the noise interference identically, leading to no reduction in signal to noise ratio (SNR). Antennas which are not a significant fraction of a wavelength in size are inevitably inefficient due to their small radiation resistance. AM broadcast radios include a small loop antenna for reception which has an extremely poor efficiency. This has little effect on the receiver's performance, but simply requires greater amplification by the receiver's electronics. Contrast this tiny component to the massive and very tall towers used at AM broadcast stations for transmitting at the very same frequency, where every percentage point of reduced antenna efficiency entails a substantial cost. The definition of antenna gain or power gain already includes the effect of the antenna's efficiency. Therefore, if one is trying to radiate a signal toward a receiver using a transmitter of a given power, one need only compare the gain of various antennas rather than considering the efficiency as well. This is likewise true for a receiving antenna at very high especially microwave frequencies, where the point is to receive a signal which is strong compared to the receiver's noise temperature. However, in the case of a directional antenna used for receiving signals with the intention of rejecting interference from different directions, one is no longer concerned with the antenna efficiency, as discussed above. In this case, rather than quoting the antenna gain, one would be more concerned with the directive gain, or simply directivity which does not include the effect of antenna in efficiency. The directive gain of an antenna can be computed from the published gain divided by the antenna's efficiency. In equation form, gain equals directivity times efficiency equals Topic. Polarization Equals. The polarization of an antenna refers to the orientation of the electric field e -plane of the radio wave with respect to the Earth's surface and is determined by the physical structure of the antenna and by its orientation. This is distinct from the antenna's directionality. Thus, a simple straight wire antenna will have one polarization when mounted vertically, and a different polarization when mounted horizontally. As a transverse wave, the magnetic field of a radio wave is at right angles to that of the electric field, but by convention, talk of an antenna's polarization is understood to refer to the direction of the electric field. Reflections generally affect polarization. For radio waves, one important reflector is the ionosphere which can change the wave's polarization. Thus for signals received following reflection by the ionosphere a skywave, a consistent polarization cannot be expected. For line-of-sight communications or ground wave propagation, horizontally or vertically polarized transmissions generally remain in about the same polarization state at the receiving location. Matching the receiving antenna's polarization to that of the transmitter can make a very substantial difference in received signal strength. Polarization is predictable from an antenna's geometry, although in some cases it is not at all obvious such as for the quad antenna. An antenna's linear polarization is generally along the direction as viewed from the receiving location of the antenna's currents when such a direction can be defined. For instance, a vertical WIP antenna or Wi-Fi antenna vertically oriented will transmit and receive in the vertical polarization. Antennas with horizontal elements, such as most rooftop TV antennas in the United States, are horizontally polarized. Broadcast TV in the US usually uses horizontal polarization. Even when the antenna system has a vertical orientation, such as an array of horizontal dipole antennas, the polarization is in the horizontal direction corresponding to the current flow. 
The polarization of a commercial antenna is an essential specification. Polarization is the sum of the E-plane orientations over time projected onto an imaginary plane perpendicular to the direction of motion of the radio wave. In the most general case, polarization is elliptical, meaning that the polarization of the radio waves varies over time. Two special cases are linear polarization, the ellipse collapses into a line as discussed above, and circular polarization in which the two axes of the ellipse are equal. In linear polarization the electric field of the radio wave oscillates back and forth along one direction, this can be affected by the mounting of the antenna but usually the desired direction is either horizontal or vertical polarization. In circular polarization, the electric field and magnetic field of the radio wave rotates at the radio frequency circularly around the axis of propagation. Circular or elliptically polarized radio waves are designated as right-handed or left-handed using the thumb in the direction of the propagation rule. For circular polarization, optical researchers use the opposite right-hand rule from the one used by radio engineers. It is best for the receiving antenna to match the polarization of the transmitted wave for optimum reception. Intermediate matchings will lose some signal strength, but not as much as a complete mismatch. A circularly polarized antenna can be used to equally well match vertical or horizontal linear polarizations. Transmission from a circularly polarized antenna received by a linearly polarized antenna or vice versa entails a 3 dB reduction in signal to noise ratio as the received power has thereby been cut in half. Topic: Impedance matching. Maximum power transfer requires matching the impedance of an antenna system, as seen looking into the transmission line, to the complex conjugate of the impedance of the receiver or transmitter. In the case of a transmitter, however, the desired matching impedance might not correspond to the dynamic output impedance of the transmitter as analyzed as a source impedance but rather the design value typically 50 ohms required for efficient and safe operation of the transmitting circuitry. The intended impedance is normally resistive but a transmitter and some receivers may have additional adjustments to cancel a certain amount of reactance in order to tweak the match when a transmission line is used in between the antenna and the transmitter or receiver one generally would like an antenna system whose impedance is resistive and near the characteristic impedance of that transmission line in order to minimize the standing wave ratio swr and the increase in transmission line losses it entails in addition to supplying a good match at the transmitter or receiver itself Antenna tuning generally refers to cancellation of any reactants seen at the antenna terminals, leaving only a resistive impedance which might or might not be exactly the desired impedance that of the transmission line. Although an antenna may be designed to have a purely resistive feedpoint impedance such as a dipole 97% of a half wavelength long this might not be exactly true at the frequency that it is eventually used at. In some cases the physical length of the antenna can be «trimmed» to obtain a pure resistance. On the other hand, the addition of a series inductance or parallel capacitance can be used to cancel a residual capacitative or inductive reactance, respectively. In some cases this is done in a more extreme manner, not simply to cancel a small amount of residual reactance, but to resonate an antenna whose resonance frequency is quite different from the intended frequency of operation. For instance, a whip antenna can be made significantly shorter than one quarter wavelength long, for practical reasons, and then resonated using a so-called loading coil. This physically large inductor at the base of the antenna has an inductive reactance which is the opposite of the capacitative reactance that such a vertical antenna has at the desired operating frequency. 
The result is a pure resistance seen at feed point of the loading coil. That resistance is somewhat lower than would be desired to match commercial coax, so an additional problem beyond cancelling the unwanted reactants is of matching the remaining resistive impedance to the characteristic impedance of the transmission line. In principle this can be done with a transformer, however the turns ratio of a transformer is not adjustable. A general matching network with at least two adjustments can be made to correct both components of impedance. Matching networks using discrete inductors and capacitors will have losses associated with those components, and will have power restrictions when used for transmitting. Avoiding these difficulties, commercial antennas are generally designed with fixed matching elements or feeding strategies to get an approximate match to standard coax, such as 50 or 75 ohms. Antennas based on the dipole rather than vertical antennas may include a ballon between the transmission line and antenna element, which may be integrated into any such matching network. Another extreme case of impedance matching occurs when using a small loop antenna usually, but not always, for receiving at a relatively low frequency where it appears almost as a pure inductor. Resonating such an inductor with a capacitor at the frequency of operation not only cancels the reactants but greatly magnifies the very small radiation resistance of such a loop. This is implemented in most AM broadcast receivers, with a small ferrite loop antenna resonated by a capacitor which is varied along with the receiver tuning in order to maintain resonance over the AM broadcast band. <laughs> antenna types Antennas can be classified in various ways. The list below groups together antennas under common operating principles, following the way antennas are classified in many engineering textbooks. Isotropic, an isotropic antenna, isotropic radiator, is a hypothetical antenna that radiates equal signal power in all directions. It is a mathematical model that is used as the base of comparison to calculate the gain of real antennas. No real antenna can have an isotropic radiation pattern. However approximately isotropic antennas, constructed with multiple elements, are used in antenna testing. The first four groups below are usually resonant antennas, when driven at their resonant frequency their elements act as resonators. Waves of current and voltage bounce back and forth between the ends, creating standing waves along the elements. Topic. Dipole The dipole is the prototypical antenna on which a large class of antennas are based. A basic dipole antenna consists of two conductors usually metal rods or wires arranged symmetrically, with one side of the balanced feedline from the transmitter or receiver attached to each. The most common type, the half-wave dipole, consists of two resonant elements just under a quarter wavelength long. This antenna radiates maximally in directions perpendicular to the antenna's axis, giving it a small directive gain of 2.15 dBi. Although half-wave dipoles are used alone as omnidirectional antennas, they are also a building block of many other more complicated directional antennas. Turnstile – two dipole antennas mounted at right angles, fed with a phase difference of 90 degrees. This antenna is unusual in that it radiates in all directions no nulls in the radiation pattern, with horizontal polarization in directions coplanar with the elements, circular polarization normal to that plane, and elliptical polarization in other directions. Used for receiving signals from satellites, as circular polarization is transmitted by many satellites. Corner reflector, a directive antenna with moderate gain of about 8 dBi often used at UHF frequencies. Consists of a dipole mounted in front of two reflective metal screens joined at an angle, usually 90 degrees. 
used as a rooftop UHF television antenna and for point-to-point -point data links, patch microstrip a type of antenna with elements consisting of metal sheets mounted over a ground plane. Similar to dipole with gain of 6 to 9 dBi. Integrated into surfaces such as aircraft bodies. Their easy fabrication using PCB techniques have made them popular in modern wireless devices. Often combined into arrays. Monopole <inaudible> 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 A monopole antenna consists of a single conductor such as a metal rod, usually mounted over the ground or an artificial conducting surface a so-called ground plane. One side of the feedline from the receiver or transmitter is connected to the conductor, and the other side to ground or the artificial ground plane. The radio waves reflected from the ground plane seem to come from an image antenna below the ground, with the monopole and its image forming a dipole, so the monopole antenna has a radiation pattern identical to the top half of the pattern of a similar dipole antenna. Since all of the equivalent dipoles radiation is concentrated in a half space, the antenna has twice 3 decibels increase of the gain of a similar dipole, not considering losses in the ground plane. The most common form is the quarter wave monopole which is one quarter of a wavelength long and has a gain of 5.12 dBi when mounted over a ground plane. Monopoles have an omnidirectional radiation pattern, so they are used for broad coverage of an area, and have vertical polarization. The ground waves used for broadcasting at low frequencies must be vertically polarized, so large vertical monopole antennas are used for broadcasting in the MF, LF, and VLF bands. Small monopoles are used as nondirectional antennas on portable radios in the HF, VHF, and UHF bands. WIP type of antenna used on mobile and portable radios in the VHF and UHF bands such as boomboxes, consists of a flexible rod, often made of telescoping segments. Rubber ducky, most common antenna used on portable two-way radios and cordless phones due to its compactness, consists of an electrically short wire helix. The helix adds inductance to cancel the capacitive reactance of the short radiator, making it resonant. Very low gain. Ground plane, a whip antenna with several rods extending horizontally from base of whip attached to the ground side of the feedline. Since whips are mounted above ground, the horizontal rods form an artificial ground plane under the antenna to increase its gain. Used as base station antennas for land mobile radio systems such as police, ambulance and taxi dispatchers. Mast radiator, a radio tower in which the tower structure itself serves as the antenna. Common form of transmitting antenna for AM radio stations and other MF and LF transmitters. At its base the tower is usually, but not necessarily, mounted on a ceramic insulator to isolate it from the ground. T and inverted L, consist of a long horizontal wire suspended between two towers with insulators, with a vertical wire hanging down from it, attached to a feedline to the receiver or transmitter. Used on LF and VLF bands. The vertical wire serves as the radiator. Since at these frequencies the vertical wire is electrically short, much shorter than a quarter wavelength, the horizontal wires serve as a capacitive hat to increase the current in the vertical radiator, increasing the gain. Very narrow bandwidth, requires loading coil to tune out any remaining capacitive reactance. Requires low resistance ground, inverted F, combines the advantages of the compactness of inverted L antenna, and the good matching of the F-type antenna. The antenna is grounded at the base and fed at some intermediate point. The position of the feed point determines the antenna impedance. Thus, matching can be achieved without the need for an extraneous matching network. Umbrella, very large wire transmitting antennas used on VLF bands. 
consists of a central mast radiator tower attached at the top to multiple wires extending out radially from the mast to ground, like a tent or umbrella, insulated at the ends. Extremely narrow bandwidth, requires large loading coil and low resistance counterpoise ground. Used for long-range military communications. Array Array antennas consist of multiple antennas working as a single antenna. Typically they consist of arrays of identical driven elements, usually dipoles fed in phase, giving increased gain over that of a single dipole. Collinear, consist of a number of dipoles in a vertical line. It is a high-gain omnidirectional antenna, meaning more of the power is radiated in horizontal directions and less into the sky or ground and wasted. Gain of 8 to 10 dBi. Used as base station antennas for land mobile radio systems such as police, fire, ambulance, and taxi dispatchers, and sector antennas for cellular base stations. Yagi Uda, one of the most common directional antennas at HF, VHF, and UHF frequencies. Consists of multiple half-wave dipole elements in a line, with a single driven element and multiple parasitic elements which serve to create a unidirectional or beam antenna. These typically have gains between 10 to 20 dBi depending on the number of elements used, and are very narrowband with a usable bandwidth of only a few percent, though there are derivative designs which relax this limitation. Used for rooftop television antennas, point-to-point -point communication links, and long-distance shortwave communication using skywave skip reflection from the ionosphere. Log periodic dipole array, often confused with the Yagi Uda, this consists of many dipole elements along a boom with gradually increasing lengths, all connected to the transmission line with alternating polarity. It is a directional antenna with a wide bandwidth. This makes it ideal for use as a rooftop television antenna, although its gain is much less than a Yagi of comparable size. Reflective array, multiple dipoles in a two-dimensional array mounted in front of a flat reflecting screen. Used for radar and UHF television transmitting and receiving antennas. Phased array, a high-gain antenna used at UHF and microwave frequencies which is electronically steerable. It consists of multiple dipoles in a two-dimensional array, each fed through an electronic phase shifter, with the phase shifters controlled by a computer control system. The beam can be instantly pointed in any direction over a wide angle in front of the antenna. Used for military radar and jamming systems. Curtain array, large directional wire transmitting antenna used at HF by shortwave broadcasting stations. It consists of a vertical rectangular array of wire dipoles suspended in front of a flat reflector screen consisting of a vertical curtain of parallel wires, all supported between two metal towers. It radiates a horizontal beam of radio waves into the sky above the horizon, which is reflected by the ionosphere to Earth beyond the horizon. Batwing or superturn style, a specialized antenna used in television broadcasting consisting of perpendicular pairs of dipoles with radiators resembling bat wings. Multiple batwing antennas are stacked vertically on a mast to make VHF television broadcast antennas. Omnidirectional radiation pattern with high gain in horizontal directions. The batwing shape gives them wide bandwidth. Microstrip, an array of patch antennas on a substrate fed by microstrip feedlines. Microwave antenna that can achieve large gains in compact space. Ease of fabrication by PCB techniques have made them popular in modern wireless devices. Beamwidth and polarization can be actively reconfigurable. Topic. Loop. Loop antennas consist of a loop or coil of wire. 
Loop antennas interact directly with the magnetic field of the radio wave, rather than its electric field, making them relatively insensitive electrical noise within about a quarter wavelength of the antenna. There are essentially two broad categories of loop antennas large loops or full wave loops and small loops. Loops with circumference of a full wavelength, or an integer multiple of a full wavelength, are naturally resonant and act somewhat similarly to the full wave or multi-wave dipole. When it is necessary to distinguish them from small loops, they are called full wave loops. Full loops have the highest radiation resistance, and hence the highest efficiency of all antennas. Their radiation resistances are several hundreds of ohms, whereas dipoles and monopoles are tens of ohms, and small loops are a few ohms, or even fractions of an ohm. Loops that are a half wavelength in circumference, with a small gap cut in the loop, are called halo antennas and are intermediate immediate in form and function between small and large loops, if the loop circumference is smaller than a half wavelength, the loop must be modified in some way to make it resonant if that is necessary. Small loops are called magnetic loops, and if modified for resonance they are also called tuned loops. Their directionality and radiation is drastically different from full wave loops. The great disadvantage of small loops, or any small antenna, is a very small radiation resistance, typically much smaller than the loss resistance, making small loops very inefficient for transmitting. However, small loops are very effective receiving antennas, especially at low frequencies, where all feasible antennas are small compared to a wavelength. Small loops are also widely used as compact direction finding antennas. Quad, although quad can refer to a single quadrilateral shaped loop, the term usually refers to two or more such loops stacked side by side. At first glance, quads resemble a box kite frame. Quad antennas are highly directional, made of multiple full-size loops lined up in a row with their planes in parallel, like sheets hanging side by side on multiple parallel clothes lines. One loop in the quad is connected to the feed line and functions as the driver for the antenna and as the main signal radiator. Quad antennas are the exact analog for loops to a Yagi Uda antenna made out of dipoles. In fact, a Yagi can be built using a mixture of loops and dipoles. Similar to Yagis, quads are used as a directional antennas on the HF bands for shortwave communication, and are sometimes preferred for longer wavelengths because if square, they are half as wide as a Yagi. In quad antennas, the loops which are not connected to the feedline act as helpers for the driven loop that is connected to the feedline. They are spaced and tuned so that they absorb and re-radiate signal power from the main loop beneficially for the directivity of the antenna, exactly like mirrors and lenses in a flashlight. The single helper loop behind the driven loop intercepts and reflects back forward the rearward traveling signal from the driven loop, and is called the reflector. The loops in front of the driven loop focus the forward traveling signal into a narrower beam, and are called directors. Because the helper loops draw power from the field created by the driven element, they are called in general parasitic elements. Ferrite loopstick, loopstick antennas are omnidirectional around their axes, and are premier examples of small loop antennas. They are the magnetic analogue of the short dipole antenna. These are used as the receiving antenna in most consumer AM radios operating in the medium wave broadcast band and lower frequencies. Wire is coiled around a ferrite core which greatly increases the coil's inductance and its effective signal capturing area. The radiation pattern is maximum at directions perpendicular to the ferrite rod. The null direction of ferrite core antennas are bidirectional and much sharper than the maximal directionality. This often makes the direction of the null more useful for locating a signal source than the direction of the strongest signal. The null direction of small loops can also be exploited to reject unwanted signals from an interfering station or noise source. Aperture 
Aperture antennas are the main type of directional antennas used at microwave frequencies and above. They consist of a small dipole or loop feed antenna inside a three-dimensional guiding structure large compared to a wavelength, with an aperture to emit the radio waves. Since the antenna structure itself is nonresonant they can be used over a wide frequency range by replacing or tuning the feed antenna. Parabolic, the most widely used high-gain antenna at microwave frequencies and above. Consists of a dish-shaped metal parabolic reflector with a feed antenna at the focus. It can have some of the highest gains of any antenna type, up to 60 dBi, but the dish must be large compared to a wavelength. Used for radar antennas, point-to-point -point data links, satellite communication, and radio telescopes, Horn, a simple antenna with moderate gain of 15 to 25 dBi that consists of a flaring metal horn attached to a waveguide. Used for applications such as radar guns, radiometers and as feed antennas for parabolic dishes. Slot, consists of a waveguide with one or more slots cut in it to emit the microwaves. Linear slot antennas emit narrow fan-shaped beams. Used as UHF broadcast antennas and marine radar antennas. Lens – A lens antenna consists of layer of dielectric or a metal screen or multiple waveguide structure of varying thickness in front of a feed antenna, which acts as a lens which refracts the radio waves, focusing them on the feed antenna. Dielectric resonator – consists of small ball or puck-shaped piece of dielectric material excited by aperture in waveguide used at millimeter wave frequencies. Traveling wave Unlike the above antennas, traveling wave antennas are nonresonant so they have inherently broad bandwidth. They are typically wire antennas multiple wavelengths long, through which the voltage and current waves travel in one direction, instead of bouncing back and forth to form standing waves as in resonant antennas. They have linear polarization, except for the helical antenna. Unidirectional traveling wave antennas are terminated by a resistor at one end equal to the antenna's characteristic resistance, to absorb the waves from one direction. This makes them inefficient as transmitting antennas. Beverage – simplest unidirectional traveling wave antenna. Consists of a straight wire one to several wavelengths long, suspended near the ground, connected to the receiver at one end and terminated by a resistor equal to its characteristic impedance, 400 to 800 ohms at the other end. Its radiation pattern has a main lobe at a shallow angle in the sky off the terminated end. It is used for reception of skywaves reflected off the ionosphere in long distance. Skip. Shortwave communication. Rhombic – consists of four equal wire sections shaped like a rhombus. It is fed by a balanced feedline at one of the acute corners, and the two sides are connected to a resistor equal to the characteristic resistance of the antenna at the other. It has a main lobe in a horizontal direction off the terminated end of the rhombus. Used for skywave communication on shortwave bands, leaky wave, microwave antennas consisting of a waveguide or coaxial cable with a slot or apertures cut in it so it radiates continuously along its length. Other antenna types The following two antenna types do not quite properly fit in any of the sections above, or fit into several, depending on the wavelength to antenna length ratio. Random wire – This describes the typical antenna used to receive shortwave radio, consisting of a random length of wire either strung outdoors between supports or indoors in a zigzag pattern along walls, connected to the receiver at one end. 
The antenna typically will have complex radiation patterns with several lobes at angles to the wire. Random wire antennas typically are categorized as folded monopole antennas, when their lengths are two wavelengths or less, but become similar to beverage antennas when they are several wavelengths long. Helical axial mode consists of a wire in the shape of a helix mounted above a reflecting screen. It radiates circularly polarized waves in a beam off the end, with a typical gain of 15 dBi. It is used at VHF and UHF frequencies. Often used for satellite communication, which uses circular polarization because it is insensitive to the relative rotation on the beam axis. When a helical antenna has about 10 turns or more, each turn a full wavelength, then it is a form of traveling wave antenna. If it only has one or a few turns and their totaled circumference one or a few wavelengths, then it is some variety of a large loop antenna. When the totaled circumference of all the turns taken together are less than one wavelength, then the helix is a loaded monopole, called a rubber ducky antenna. Topic effect of ground Ground reflections is one of the common types of multipath. The radiation pattern and even the driving point impedance of an antenna can be influenced by the dielectric constant and especially conductivity of nearby objects. For a terrestrial antenna, the ground is usually one such object of importance. The antenna's height above the ground, as well as the electrical properties permittivity and conductivity of the ground, can then be important. Also, in the particular case of a monopole antenna, the ground or an artificial ground plane serves as the return connection for the antenna current thus having an additional effect, particularly on the impedance seen by the feed line. When an electromagnetic wave strikes a plane surface such as the ground, part of the wave is transmitted into the ground and part of it is reflected, according to the Fresnel coefficients. If the ground is a very good conductor then almost all of the wave is reflected 180 degrees out of phase, whereas a ground modeled as a lossy dielectric can absorb a large amount of the wave's power. The power remaining in the reflected wave, and the phase shift upon reflection, strongly depend on the wave's angle of incidence and polarization. The dielectric constant and conductivity or simply the complex dielectric constant is dependent on the soil type and is a function of frequency. For very low frequencies to high frequencies at frequencies between 3 and 30 MHz, a large portion of the energy from a horizontally polarized antenna reflects off the ground, with almost total reflection at the grazing angles important for ground wave propagation. That reflected wave, with its phase reversed, can either cancel or reinforce the direct wave, depending on the antenna height in wavelengths and elevation angle for a sky wave. On the other hand, vertically polarized radiation is not well reflected by the ground except at grazing incidence or over very highly conducting surfaces such as seawater. However the grazing angle reflection important for ground wave propagation, using vertical polarization, is in phase with the direct wave, providing a boost of up to 6 dB, as is detailed below. At VHF and above greater than 30 MHz, the ground becomes a poorer reflector. However it remains a good reflector especially for horizontal polarization and grazing angles of incidence. That is important as these higher frequencies usually depend on horizontal line of sight propagation except for satellite communications, the ground then behaving almost as a mirror. The net quality of a ground reflection depends on the topography of the surface. When the irregularities of the surface are much smaller than the wavelength, the dominant regime is that of specular reflection, and the receiver sees both the real antenna and an image of the antenna under the ground due to reflection. But if the ground has irregularities not small compared to the wavelength, reflections will not be coherent but shifted by random phases. With shorter wavelengths, higher frequencies, this is generally the case. 
Whenever both the receiving or transmitting antenna are placed at significant heights above the ground relative to the wavelength, waves specularly reflected by the ground will travel a longer distance than direct waves, inducing a phase shift which can sometimes be significant. When a sky wave is launched by such an antenna, that phase shift is always significant unless the antenna is very close to the ground compared to the wavelength. The phase of reflection of electromagnetic waves depends on the polarization of the incident wave. Given the larger refractive index of the ground typically n equals 2 compared to air n equals 1, the phase of horizontally polarized radiation is reversed upon reflection a phase shift of pi radians or 180 degrees. On the other hand, the vertical component of the wave's electric field is reflected at grazing angles of incidence approximately in phase. These phase shifts apply as well to a ground modeled as a good electrical conductor. This means that a receiving antenna sees an image of the antenna but with reversed currents. That current is in the same absolute direction as the actual antenna if the antenna is vertically oriented and thus vertically polarized but opposite the actual antenna if the antenna current is horizontal. The actual antenna which is transmitting the original wave then also may receive a strong signal from its own image from the ground. This will induce an additional current in the antenna element, changing the current at the feedpoint for a given feedpoint voltage. Thus the antenna's impedance, given by the ratio of feedpoint voltage to current, is altered due to the antenna's proximity to the ground. This can be quite a significant effect when the antenna is within a wavelength or two of the ground. But as the antenna height is increased, the reduced power of the reflected wave due to the inverse square law allows the antenna to approach its asymptotic feedpoint impedance given by theory. At lower heights, the effect on the antenna's impedance is very sensitive to the exact distance from the ground, as this affects the phase of the reflected wave relative to the currents in the antenna. Changing the antenna's height by a quarter wavelength, then changes the phase of the reflection by 180 degrees, with a completely different effect on the antenna's impedance. The ground reflection has an important effect on the net far field radiation pattern in the vertical plane, that is, as a function of elevation angle, which is thus different between a vertically and horizontally polarized antenna. Consider an antenna at a height h above the ground, transmitting a wave considered at the elevation angle θ. For a vertically polarized transmission the magnitude of the electric field of the electromagnetic wave produced by the direct ray plus the reflected ray is E V equals 2 E 0 cos 2 pi h lambda sin theta display style text style left e underscore v right equals 2 left e underscore 0 right left cos left 2 pi h over lambda sin theta right right Thus the power received can be as high as four times that due to the direct wave alone such as when theta equals zero, following the square of the cosine. The sine inversion for the reflection of horizontally polarized emission instead results in E H equals 2 E 0 sin 2 Pi H Lambda Sin Theta Display style text style left E underscore H right equals two left E underscore zero right left sin left two Pi H over Lambda Sin Theta right right where E zero Display style script style E underscore zero is the electrical field that would be received by the direct wave if there were no ground 
Theta is the elevation angle of the wave being considered. Lambda display style script style lambda is the wavelength h display style script style h is the height of the antenna half the distance between the antenna and its image for horizontal propagation between transmitting and receiving antennas situated near the ground reasonably far from each other the distances traveled by the direct and reflected rays are nearly the same there is almost no relative phase shift. If the emission is polarized vertically, the two fields direct and reflected add and there is maximum of received signal. If the signal is polarized horizontally, the two signals subtract and the received signal is largely cancelled. The vertical plane radiation patterns are shown in the image at right. With vertical polarization there is always a maximum for theta equals zero, horizontal propagation left pattern. For horizontal polarization, there is cancellation at that angle. Note that the above formulae and these plots assume the ground as a perfect conductor. These plots of the radiation pattern correspond to a distance between the antenna and its image of 2.5 λ. As the antenna height is increased, the number of lobes increases as well. The difference in the above factors for the case of theta equals zero is the reason that most broadcasting transmissions intended for the public uses vertical polarization. For receivers near the ground, horizontally polarized transmissions suffer cancellation. For best reception, the receiving antennas for these signals are likewise vertically polarized. In some applications where the receiving antenna must work in any position, as in mobile phones, the base station antennas use mixed polarization, such as linear polarization at an angle with both vertical and horizontal components or circular polarization. On the other hand, analog television transmissions are usually horizontally polarized, because in urban areas buildings can reflect the electromagnetic waves and create ghost images due to multipath propagation. Using horizontal polarization, ghosting is reduced because the amount of reflection in the horizontal polarization off the side of a building is generally less than in the vertical direction. Vertically polarized analog television have been used in some rural areas. In digital terrestrial television such reflections are less problematic, due to robustness of binary transmissions and error correction. <laughs> <laughs> Mutual impedance and interaction between antennas Current circulating in one antenna generally induces a voltage across the feedpoint of nearby antennas or antenna elements. The mathematics presented below are useful in analyzing the electrical behavior of antenna arrays, where the properties of the individual array elements such as half-wave dipoles are already known. If those elements were widely separated and driven in a certain amplitude and phase, then each would act independently as that element is known to. However, because of the mutual interaction between their electric and magnetic fields due to proximity, the currents in each element are not simply a function of the applied voltage according to its driving point impedance, but depend on the currents in the other nearby elements. This now is a near-field phenomenon which could not be properly accounted for using the freeze transmission formula for instance. This near-field effect creates a different set of currents at the antenna terminals resulting in distortions in the far-field radiation patterns, however, the distortions may be removed using a simple set of network equations. The elements' feedpoint currents and voltages can be related to each other using the concept of mutual impedance. Z J I Display style script style Z underscore G between every pair of antennas just as the mutual impedance J Omega M Display style script style J Omega M 
describes the voltage induced in one inductor by a current through a nearby coil coupled to it through a mutual inductance M. The mutual impedance Z 21 display style script style z underscore 21 between two antennas is defined as z j i equals v j i i display style z underscore g equals v underscore j over i underscore i where i I display style text style I underscore I is the current flowing in antenna I and V J display style text style V underscore J is the voltage induced at the open circuited feed point of antenna J due to I one display style text style I underscore one when all other currents IC are zero. The mutual impedances can be viewed as the elements of a symmetric square impedance matrix Z. Note that the diagonal elements Z I I equals V I I I Display style z underscore e equals v underscore i over i underscore i are simply the driving point impedances of each element. Using this definition, the voltages present at the feed points of a set of coupled antennas can be expressed as the multiplication of the impedance matrix times the vector of currents. Written out as discrete equations, that means v. One equals I one Z eleven plus I two Z twelve plus plus I N Z one N V two equals i 1 z 21 plus i 2 z 22 plus plus i n z 2 n v n equals i 1 z n 1 plus i 2 z n 2 plus plus i n z n n display style begin matrix v underscore 1 and equals and i underscore 1 z underscore 11 and plus and i underscore 2 z underscore 12 and plus n c d o t s and plus and i underscore n z underscore 1 n v underscore 2 and equals and i underscore 1 z underscore 21 and plus and i underscore 2 z underscore 22 and plus n c d o t s and plus and i underscore n z underscore 2 n v d o t s n n v d o t s n n v d o t s n n n n v d o t s v underscore n and equals and i underscore 1 z underscore n 1 and plus and i underscore 2 z underscore n 2 and plus n c d o t s and plus and i underscore n z underscore n n end matrix where v i display style script style v underscore I is the voltage at the terminals of antenna I display style I I I display style script style I underscore I is the current flowing between the terminals of antenna I display style I Z I I display style script style Z underscore E is the driving point impedance of antenna I display style I Z I J display style script style Z underscore I J is the mutual impedance between antennas I display style I and J display style j as as the case for mutual inductances z i j equals z j i 
Display style script style z underscore i j equals z underscore g. This is a consequence of Lorentz reciprocity. For an antenna element i display style i not connected to anything open circuited, one can write i i equals zero. Display style i underscore i equals zero, but for an element i, display style i, which is short circuited, a current is generated across that short, but no voltage is allowed, so the corresponding v i equals zero. Display style text style v underscore i equals zero. This is the case, for instance, with the so-called parasitic elements of a Yagi Uda antenna where the solid rod can be viewed as a dipole antenna shorted across its feed point. Parasitic elements are unpowered elements that absorb and reradiate RF energy according to the induced current calculated using such a system of equations. With a particular geometry, it is possible for the mutual impedance between nearby antennas to be zero. This is the case, for instance, between the crossed dipoles used in the turnstile antenna. See also Notes <laughs> 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 <laughs>